Yo people, welcome back to another video. I've got the new trim, I've got the new beard. I'm in the new 1.4 billion pound studio and we're here for the first time ever on the channel for the one to 20 Premier League predictions. Who do I think is going down? Do I think this is Arsenal's year or is it City's five Pete? Arnie slots in at Liverpool, but nobody else is. Shout out to Zubamendi and my club Chelsea. Signed a couple players, some would say too many players, do I think we're going to make top four? Let's talk. So let's start at the bottom of the Premier League table and it pains me to say it's the former Premier League champions, Enzo Maresca's last team, Leicester City. There's a looming points deduction as the Guardian reports and that could definitely put them in their place but it's the defence that also concerns me in regards to FaZe and Vestergaard not really trusting them at the top level on their return. Also Vardy is an extra year older and they've let Iheanacho go on a free to Sevilla. Drewsbury Hall's of course gone to Chelsea, but I am at least looking forward to Fatou, who got 13 assists and six goals in the championship as a 20 year old last season, looks immensely talented off that right hand side. So we should have some fun regardless. At 19th, I have Southampton managed by Russell Martin, a lovely homecoming for Adam Lallana, but I'm questioning how much can he contribute at this stage of his career. Their standout signings were Harwood Bellis from Manchester City, who was on a stint in the championship with them last season. They have a nice track record with Lavia previously a couple years ago and also you could take a look at Flint Downs from West Ham as another big purchase for them but with Che Adams leaving and some other players alongside him it just doesn't feel like they've added enough quality to the squad to really stay up to be honest. In 18th place I've got Ipswich Town managed by Kieran McKenna the highly sought after manager over the summer. Their big main signing Amari Hutchinson on a permanent deal from Chelsea after impressing in the championship last season they're going to heavily depend upon him for goals and for chance creation off that right hand side but for me we saw Burnley and Vincent company punished for those brave performances last season trying to plow from the back trying to to entertain so to speak but do they have the quality and that's what I question with Ipswich so I'm putting them in the relegation zone. In 17th I have Wolves managed by Gary O'Neill. It still feels like George Mendes has a bit of a grip or a clutch on this club. Young players in Gomez and Pedro Lima coming in but will they get the game time? Will they have the impact on the first 11? Will they be the Fabio Silvers of 2024-25? Who knows? But I'm looking at Tommy Doyle signing from Manchester City. He's at a good age of 22. We know they've got a top academy, so I'm expecting him to look to make an impact. But they did make big sales in Pedro Neto and Kilman, over 100 million recouped. And I need to see some more of that money reinvested into this team before I can put them above 17th. Moving on to 16th, I've got Diversity Deitch's Everton, who's absolutely killing it on the quota, bringing the Barclays back. It's lump it, slump it football, but he's not getting much help in regards to recruitment as Everton are potentially still scared after the Premier League gave them plenty of points deductions last season and you can't blame them. Oh, Nana, the space eater sold to Aston Villa. Not much improvement in the 11. It feels like Sean Maloney and Zaki's Wigan Athletic almost sleepwalking to relegation, but they just need to keep themselves afloat for one more season before they move into the new stadium by the docks in 25-26. In 15th, I have Ariola's Bournemouth, obviously one of their big signings, sinister from Leeds. Very much looking forward to watching him for them this season, but I I cannot look past them losing Solanke even for a hefty fee of 65 million pounds to Tottenham. He was immense for them last season getting key goals. He had a good supporting cast with Travenir and others but I still believe that goals at that rate don't come by too often to teams in the lower half of the league and it's very very difficult to replace those players and of course they've even lost Lloyd Kelly to Newcastle on a free as well. So. I think with the football that they play and they played last season, I'd expect that to continue those fundamentals to be there. But I really need to see how they reinvest that money to bring goals back into this team. I'm keeping an eye on Eddie Nketiah as a replacement. I think he could get them 10 to 12 goals after his deal to Marseille fell through. In 14th, I've got Brentford led by Thomas Frank, a very astute manager. Slightly surprised he didn't get an opportunity up the league at a team like a West Ham, but he remains. And also Ivan Tony remains as of now. Now from a player quality standpoint, that helps Brentford massively. We know what Ivan Tony brings. We saw it at the Euros for England, even in his cameos and obviously his incredible penalty taking. But from a financial standpoint, they could still do with a sale considering he's only got a year left. They have Vissa, they have Mbwemu, they won't have their new 33 million euro striker Thiago until the end of 2024. But I'm very, very interested to see 
how Fabio Cavallio does after signing from Liverpool. I remember how talented he was at Fulham, along with the likes of Sessegnon. So I think he could be someone to watch this season and he might surprise a few people. In 13th, I've got Brighton managed by the youngest ever Premier League manager in history, Fabian Hoefler, and he's brought in Wiffler. I hope I haven't butchered any of the names for the midfielder. I mean, it's going to be fascinating to see how this goes because he is 31. So I'm expecting teething problems and learning curves. But Brighton's recruitment over the years has been brilliant in regards to player recruitment, also manager recruitment. And I'm assuming this midfielder that's coming in, Wiffler, is going to be absolutely integral to his build up and his way of play. So his success is very much equal and in line with the manager's success. But I'm also looking at the likes of Adingra. I'm looking at the likes of, can they keep Incencio fit? Can they keep Pe Jao Pedro fit? Who I think is a very good striker. Um, what will happen with Gilmore? Will he go to Napoli? How will Lewis Dunk and Webster play at centre-back? There's been a lot of errors between them for internationals and also club. And when I've been watching Webster in the last few years. So it's going to be very interesting to just see if everything settles down and how quickly it does. I do expect a bit of a drop off outside of the top 10, but I'm sure they're still going to play some really, really good football. And now in 12th, I've got Nuno's Nottingham Forest, who've had three significant in and three out. I actually think this is quiet for them on average. Usually they're not only shaking the window, but they're breaking the glass. They usually have 12 to 15 players coming in and it's a lot of settling in for new players and, you know, shaking up the stability of existing players. Whereas this time they are just adding a little bit on top of what they've already done. And they've done a lot in the last few years. So I actually think this is a good thing. hudson Adoy, Elanga, Gibbs-White. These type of players on the transition, I thought hudson Adoy really showed signs of stepping up last season and taking responsibility. So I'm looking forward to just seeing them the same as they were last year of a couple of changes, a couple of new faces here and there. And I think there can be some stability here because they have bought some very good players over the years. I'm looking forward to this. In 11th, I've got Fulham managed by Marco Silva. Massive exits in regards to Paulinho and Tossin. That defensive spine needs to be realigned. But I am going to look at some of the positives with Smith Rowe coming into this team with a resurgence of form in preseason and maybe a chip on his shoulder for the whole season. Goals and assists bring in some extra quality to the attack. And like I said, I always actually wanted him to try and push for that left half space at Arsenal and really make it his own. I felt like he had the ability to do so, but he couldn't get over the injuries. If he can keep fit and alongside Munez, we're now just looking at the supporting cast of Iwobi and Reed and Traore and Wilson to add to the goals as well. And I think Fulham could be a good side. Now, before we go any further, massive shout out to Odds Checker for sponsoring this video. Odds Checker's million pound predictor is free to play. And with the opportunity to win one million pounds, just click the link in the description to make your EPL table right now. Now, in 10th place, I've got Crystal Palace led by Glasner, one of the most exciting teams to watch in the back end of last season. They were scoring goals by the truckload. Now, unfortunately, they did lose Elise, which cannot be underestimated for me. A player that is borderline world class, one of my favorite players outside of Chelsea. He's got absolutely everything and that's why he's playing for the caliber of club that is Bayern Munich. However, there is still plenty of talent left in the tank if they can refuse the offers coming in for the likes of potentially Eze, Mark Gerhi to Newcastle and of course there's still players that could be coming in like a Chukwameka from Chelsea for 20 million and they've signed Saar, former Watford winger as well, as well as Adam Walton who went to the Euros with England. We know what a talent he is and Mateta was in red hot form if he can continue that streak. So there's still plenty to play with for Palace and I think they could definitely crack the top 10. So in ninth, I've got Newcastle under Eddie Howe. Very harsh potentially considering they've only got one game a week and I think fourth to ninth is very interchangeable. If Almerim does go to MLS, I think the right wing could do with an adjustment, but look out for Lewis Hall and Livermento this season. I think they're going to have big seasons, very talented, high potential fullbacks, and they're going to give a lot of youth and dynamism to this side. Isak, Bruno Gimraes, Gordon, a lot of quality. I think there could be a couple more additions, like I said, just to give them that extra assault on Europe. But I think they're going to be there or thereabouts. Like I said, it's going to be very, very close between all the teams. Now, in eighth place, I've got Manchester United, obviously in charge is Ten Hag. I know Man United fans will be fuming with what I'm spewing. But listen, the numbers last season were a nonsense. The amount of shots faced were a problem. And until the new DM is signed to replace Casemiro, who is heavily relied upon when he shouldn't be, it's going to be open sesame and the defenders are going to be asked to do too much work, in my opinion. Now, Delit and Mazuari are cal calculated risks. 
I think if they play to the level that they're capable of, they're going to be instant upgrades on those areas. Yoro being injured is unfortunate, but I'm looking at the attack as well. And Rashford, Sancho, Xerxes, will these guys get enough goals to help Hoyland and contribute? Anthony is another one. There's still a lot of question marks around Manchester United despite the new signings and the Ten Hag situation is still a massive question mark. So I've got them eight. In seventh place, I've got Aston Villa and Unai Emery, who's very well versed in handling league campaigns and European campaigns together. So Villa fans have every right to feel like I'm being too harsh with Barkley coming in, Ian Matson coming in, Onana coming in to replace Douglas Louise. Obviously, Diaby left as well. But that new format, Champions League, is going to be high quality, difficult games alongside the league campaign. It's going to be interesting to see how they handle it and deal with it. But they definitely have the depth, that's for sure. And they've got the quality. So like I said, ninth to fourth is really interchangeable. And I think it's going to be very close. There's not going to be many points to split these teams. In sixth place, I've got Tottenham under Big Ange. I slightly regret this prediction already. I feel like I've been too nice to Tottenham today, but I've already said it. So here we are. Now, the wingers, I've got massive concerns over in terms of Timo Werner. Brennan Johnson wasn't worth the fee paid. Kuliseski needs to rediscover his form from the first six months. Solomon is really of no use. And like I said, Son is not a winger anymore so it's down to Solanke to put the ball in the back of the net and prove the 65 million's worth this team is heavily reliant on Madison staying fit Basuma and Benton Core rediscovering their form like I said I really like the back line it's just really down to Ange to be a little bit maybe more tactically flexible in terms of that high line but yeah I've got concerns over this team I've probably put them too high for my own personal preference but it's too late now to back out <laughs> now in fifth place I'm drinking that West Ham Kool-Aid because They've signed some very exciting players. Todibo from Nice, highly regarded defender, lots of clubs interested. The only question mark is maybe Lopetegui for many after his Wolves stint, but you look at wan you look at Kilman coming in, you look at Somerville, Kudus, Paqueta, Bowen, Falkrug, really good Euros coming off the bench many times making an impact. These are players that would start for top six clubs. So I feel obligated to put them in the top six, especially when they have no Europe and they're going to be playing once a week. So they feel like they're inspired by Aston Villa and Newcastle who have recently broken into that top five, top four even. Um, and I feel like West Ham are right there waiting to pounce. Definitely a dark horse. If anything, just a horse. <laughs> in fourth position, we've got Chelsea. Significant additions in the summer, looking at Tossin, Drewsbury Hall and Pedro Neto so far. This is kind of based upon multiple factors and facets. Also, Chelsea have a lot of players, some quality players, would you believe it, in this squad after spending a billy. And Pedro Neto, Nkuku, Parma, Enzo, Caicedo and Lavia all fall into this group. Players that have the ability to put Chelsea in fourth. Gusto have the ability to put Chelsea in the Champions League if Maresca can make it click, if Maresca can get them playing. But, but they also have the capacity to put themselves in seventh, put themselves in sixth if they have too much of a overload in terms of squad numbers, if there are injuries and they can't keep people fit, if they don't do the business in the back end of the market, that makes sense. So Chelsea, as I said at the start, ninth to fourth is very interchangeable. I have to have optimism at the start of the season. You know me, with all the criticism I have for my club, I still have to put them as high as I possibly can imagine them. And that is in fourth. Now in third place, I've got Arnis Slots, Liverpool. Listen, I know they've not done any transfer business. The only team in Europe to not do so after getting rejected by Zuba Mendy, but it pains me to say it, the foundations are still there for Liverpool. Now, don't get me wrong. They're not gonna be in a title race and they're not going to go anywhere fast if they don't show some ambition in the market to fill up the holes in certain positions. But they do have enough goal getters in the team. They do have enough goal scorers to win them games in terms of Salah, in terms of Jota, if they can keep them fit. The, the big characters and big names like Alisson and Van Dijk and Trent are still going to pop up and handle business at the highest level. So I can't sit here and say that Liverpool, even if they don't do anything, I expect them to have to worry about their Champions League position because I just don't rate the teams behind them high enough to push Liverpool off their perch. But in terms of a title race, absolutely no chance if they don't get that holding midfielder. In second place, I've got Pep Guardiola's Manchester City. I just feel like so far in this transfer window, they're leaving a little bit too much on the table for a certain other club. Savinio, the only significant incoming. Alvarez, the only significant outgoing. But there is a couple of positions that they're playing with, in my opinion, in regards to Rodri. If he was to be burnt out or suspended, injured, like we saw last season, 
things do collapse. Haaland is known for a knock at the moment. There is no striker back up and there's a heavy reliance on the likes of Grealish and Doku to really step up this season and start providing output consistently. So it, it's an interesting situation. You never rule off, rule out Pep. You never rule out Manchester City. Uh, a a drop-off for them is nothing mad. It's something like probably 80, 85 points, which is still a great season for almost every club in this league apart from them. But it might just be enough to leave, unfortunately, the gap for another club to win this league. And in first place, I say this with regret. I say this with disdain. But for me, I have a gut feeling and I'm going to give it. It's Arsenal to win the Premier League. I just, I just feel like regardless of the lack of maybe satisfaction on your side for the window, the striker situation with Inketia, maybe the left midfield position, I think will still be addressed. Saka for the backup. Like I said, Manchester City have their own issues and things that they would probably like to improve on. And the average age of your squad is in a better position right now for an up, upward trajectory. We look at De Bruyne, could there be a, a little dip? When you look at your players, they should really be only on the up. And I'm looking at the goals last season, the most goals scored, the least goals conceded, the fact that you've added Califor Califiori and now set pieces is going to probably be even more of a threat, which is, I don't even understand how that's possible. Just the amount of areas that Arsenal can go to for goals. Martinelli can only get better in comparison to last season. Trossard can still chip in off the bench. Jesus could do a hell of a lot better than last season. Again, there's so much actual improvement to come from certain individuals that even after last season pushing City close, these, these players that I'm mentioning, some of them didn't even really participate to the level that they can. So there's still a lot more to come from individuals already at the club. And there's enough in there to get the amount of goals, like I said, the most goals scored in any Arsenal team last season. And that's without a clinical striker. So I just I just have a gut feeling that unfortunately they are, they are going to get over the line. Third time's the charm. They've been incrementally building to this moment and the motivation, the knowledge, the know-how is going to be there. There isn't really any reason why they shouldn't be going just over the edge now to get this one done unless Manchester City put up a 95 plus point season Arsenal really should be aiming to pip them so yeah and that's all being said without the window even closed you know there's still potential business to be done so painfully regretfully unfortunately this is my prediction damn it <laughs> so there you are that's the video. Premier League predictions all wrapped up, done and dusted for 24-25. Let's see how right I am. People will say that I'm doing reverse psychology. I'm doing juju. I'm actually not. This is me giving my honest thoughts. It's paining me. I'm probably going to shed a tear in a minute. But if it does work in my favour and, and it somehow backfires on you guys, then I will I will live. I will I will be there. Molly, I can't believe I'll, I'll enjoy. So you know, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But you guys give me your predictions in the comments down below. Let me know what you think and feel about everything I've said in this video. And I'll see you guys next time. Big up your damn selves and a bit people. Peace.